I'm a sensory branding consultant. So I'm going to just share with you a little bit about what that's about. Um, and where it came from was that I started my career, I was a product manager. And I was the product manager for this. Uh, this is a very early PC. It's an NCR Decision Made 5. And, and I went to look, I went to the, when I was preparing the presentation, I went to look on the internet to find a photograph of it. And the only photograph I could find was actually in the Museum of Computing. <laughs> So that gives you a sense of how long I've been doing what I do. But, you know, just to sum up, I, you know, I was constantly updating price lists. I was constantly updating rational product information. It was all about product spec. And I, my next slide is a picture of me at my, at my work at the time. <laughs> that's me. That's, this is me. And that's exactly what it felt like. I was on a hamster's wheel going nowhere fast. It was deathly boring. And I really felt quite strongly that just putting price lists out and just putting product specifications out was just not of interest to the people who buy computers. And I had the temerity to go to our chief executive at the time and say so. And the net result of that is that I got off the hamster's wheel because I was fired. <laughs> A few, few days later, I was actually at a party, and it wasn't a very good party. I'm sure you've all been to them where basically you're talking about work. And um, I was actually talking about the fact that I was no longer in work. So I, I came a little bit centre center stage, you know, why, what, what, why aren't you in work? And I told them the story that I'd been thrown out. Um, and I, I said that I felt that, you know, there were other marketing people there, and I said that I felt that it was important that as marketers we did more than just appeal to the rational brain. And I said that actually I felt it was important that we used the senses to create experiences. And I'm interested in the sense of smell, and I think we should use smell for marketing. And they laughed at me. And um, I'm quite stubborn. A little bit like Ruben you know, was saying earlier, you know, he's, I said, well, I'm going to do it. And so I did. And I set up... Um, I did a bit, a bit more research, actually. I didn't just start there. I wanted to understand our relationship to, being, to brands and how, as humans, we were largely vis visual. And one of the first things I discovered was this little statistic, which you know, I won't ask you to guess, but it's actually the number of TV adverts the average Western world child is exposed to every single year of their life. Crikey, yes. Um, by the time that child is around 60, that's, that equates to 2 million TV adverts. How on earth can that person ever possibly remember? Actually, it becomes even more scary if you do some sums. It's about um, eight, uh, eight hours a day for seven uh, days a week of six years of that child's life just exposed to visual advertising. How can any of it cut through? And when I was a child myself, there used to just be one TV station, and it was ITV. And, you know, we maybe would go to school the following day and talk about the TV advert that we'd seen. It was sort of a bit of a shared experience. When I started in business, that, you know, people could remember. Um, when I started in business, that recall had, had fallen to, you know, a scary amount. Today, you know, my kids don't talk about what they've seen on TV, and they certainly don't remember it. So this whole world of visual overload was getting nowhere. So I started to think, well, you know, maybe I was onto something here. Today, visual messaging has increased by about 400%. Pretty scary stuff. So the old marketing model, I believe, and this is where my purpose started to come through, was broken. It was no longer working. It was all about talk hat. It was about talk hat, it was mass media, it was two-dimensional, and it wasn't getting through. People didn't care. Um, it, something had to change. So that was sort of the start of my, my purpose. Um, and I set up a company in 93 to communicate to brands through the sense of smell. And I have to say, for the first few years, the people who laughed at me at that party were probably right. It was a bit, you know, too left field. But gradually, it's become a bit more mainstream, and we work with a you know, load of interesting brands. Great. But I still felt, well, you know, OK, it's kind of interesting. It's sort of making a bit of an impression. But I didn't really quite fully understand why. And so I spent the next few years doing a bit more learning and a bit more research. Um, and one of the key things I wanted to sort of think about is what is a brand? And for me, a brand was essentially this. It's it's a promise. It's the promise that that brand gives to us as individuals. It, you know, it, it stands for something, and we have certain expectations. Problem is that brands are also an experience. 
And if they don't, the promise doesn't lift up to the experience. So the promise is all about, you know, the mass communications, as I was saying earlier, you know, that bit that has to change. If it doesn't, um, isn't consistent with the experience, it, this sort of virtual circle breaks down. Um, so I felt that what brands are very good at were giving the promise, but not actually delivering the experience, and there's no sort of consistency here. I was thinking, well, you know, why is that? Why does the promise break down? It's like the promise we make to individuals, our friends and, you know, our family. Uh, so I was sort of thinking a little bit more about that. And um, it kind of led me on to, a, to another question. Where does the brand preference come from? And this is the bit that I, that I started to get quite interested in. And this ties in with what uh, Kirsty was saying earlier. If we look at our relationship with brands from sort of an emotional point of view, or a rational point of view, remember that computer product manager which was sort of trying to talk about all the features and benefits, yawn, yawn, yawn. And from our conscious to our subconscious, all the research I was doing in this, this area was essentially saying the same thing, that 90% or more of our relationship with our, the brands that we love and we know was happening up here. And this got kind of interesting because when I was doing more and more research and looking at how the brain works, the, the, um, the cortex, the, the rational part of our brain, is where primarily the senses of sight, words and pictures are processed. So we're spending all this money communicating to our eyes and ears, and it was going into this part of our brain, whereas the sense of smell and taste and touch was happening up here. So it kind of became, oh, this is interesting. Um, and it was about that time I met, oh, just a little, little example of a bit of fun for you. Here are all the, um, the rational reasons. These are actually four um, saloon cars, executive saloon cars, and these are all the rational reasons that you might choose one over another. So it's price and engine size and blah de blah de blah de blah And I would ask any one of you to be able to choose one of those cars over another. It's not really possible, is it? But if I do this, suddenly you get the point. It's all the emotions that those labels, those badges represent that make that decision easy. Okay? Um, and it was about this time I met this guy. This guy's called Martin Lindstrom, Lindstrom and he's a sort of branding commentator and guru great word, but it's what he is. And he just launched a book called Brand Sense, and he said, we met at a conference, not unlike this, and he said, well, you seem to be sort of practicing these ideas, and the book's creating a lot of interest, we should form a business. One thing I learned is to turn a book into a business is much harder than you might think, it's quite hard. But anyway, we formed this business, and we were continuing to learn, and one of the key things that came out of that book is essentially this, but when you ask consumers what senses are important to them in their relationship to brands, surprisingly, which is the blue bar chart, surprisingly the senses are, are sort of equally in balance. Um, you know, we think of ourselves as primarily visual, but actually look at how important things like smell and taste and touch were too. And yet the green bar, when we asked marketing directors how they were spending their budgets, you can see there was an imbalance. So we were overspending to vision, which I'd already kind of felt, and completely underspending to these other senses. So, you know, this was really feeding into my sense. I felt like I had a purpose to change the way people were doing marketing. A bit of a lone voice, but that's what I felt. Um, so what I've learned in the last 20 years, I just want to share with you now. And I'd like you to all imagine that you're single and that you're at a party. And let's be honest, if you're single and you're at a party, you're going to be looking around the room to see who's attractive. So you're going to be using sight. Some of, some of you have got to get <laughs> jumping ahead here. <laughs> and if you've seen someone who's attractive, you might you know, go up and, and talk to them. So you're going to be using sound. And you know, I think here we're still sort of screening. You know, do we like this person or not? We're using some degree of rationale here. But let's assume we're getting on quite well now and uh, we've had a glass of wine, and we've picked up a bit of courage, and we've maybe touched them gently on the arm, led them onto the dance floor. We're getting up a close and personal now, and touch is coming in, that's nice. <laughs> 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 and then as you're getting closer, you might smell their wonderful, you know, their wonderful scent and their, their personal body, and it's all becoming very nice. <laughs> 
<laughs> and of course, where does it lead? Taste. And I'm, talk I'm talking a kiss. And it's for me, it's a spiral into more and more and more of what I call intimacy. And it's my contention, my belief, that as it is with our human relationships, so it is as well for our relationship with brands. We are basically on a spiral to intimacy. And my job as a sensory branding consultant is to find those, I call them somatic markers, and Kirsty was talking about those moments that we associate in our brains with a significant thing. And what I do for brands is I help them to create signatures of sound, signature flavor, signature fragrance that you can associate with that positive experience, not just the promise, but the positive experience, and create that positive loop and that feedback loop. So that's what I do, create these things that populate that journey in towards intimacy. And um, I'd just like to very quickly share uh, an, ex you know, an example of the sort of thing that I get involved with, which is loads of fun. And this was for a bank in Colombia. And, um, Banking in Colombia is all exactly the same. It's all sort of cookie cutter. They all feel exactly the same. They're all called Banco to this and Banco to that. Um, but they had, there was one bank who just got a new chief executive and she was very, uh, she's a woman, I think that's significant because she was quite visionary and in touch with the, her senses. And she said, I want to completely change um, banking in Colombia. And she said, I want to start by having a completely sort of different set of visions and values. And for her, it was about passion, courage, humor, a sense of humor for a bank, really, okay, um, innovation, and intelligence. And so what we did is we worked with her, with her and we defined each of those emotional values uh, as a set of sensory sig signature symbols, symbolisms. Um, and we captured those all together and we created what we call a brand in a box. So far, so good. Um, and then the next step was to interpret those into a completely radical new retail design. And I only share with this with you because there are some examples of the sort of thing that was created in that banking environment. And I'll just quickly play a video. Sorry. So this is how the bank looked before. All very, you know, typical bank. This is actually a signature sound that we created. Embedded in is a, is a logo. Um, and, you know, it, it starts to feel very different. So we, we discovered that the, it was going to be the world's first female bank. Um, we create soundscapes, and this is all about communicating those emotions. Um, we created signature flavor and sound. I think I'll probably just jump through this a little bit. Just, these are the soundscapes that communicate those values, but in the context of the Colombian society. You can actually use soundscapes because this sound is slightly below the resting human heart rate. It slows people down. And then there are other areas where you want people to move through a little bit quicker and that's slightly above the human heart rate with a little bit more harmonic tension. Gets people moving through faster. and branded sounds which were like the jungle from, from the heart of where the, the, the bank first started. You get the point. So um, basically, my, my purpose for the last 20 years is essentially to, to, to break down this idea that you know, we have to talk at as brands. It's, for me, it's more about you know, the need to engage with, to create those experiences that appeal across all, all, all senses, that go to the limbic system, the part of our brain that controls our emotions and memories, um, that delivers value, but it's also where people are, you know, where people are going to be talking to one another. Instead of that idea of mass media, it's about getting people talking to one another about, you know, what they care about. And okay, it's commercial, it's not sort of going to change the world, but, um, you know, if they care about it, they're going to share it with their friends. And it's multiple senses, and, um, you know, it, it, for me, it's about creating that emotional impact, which creates this sort of intimacy for brands. Um, and I've been on this journey and, you know, in the last two, three years, you know, originally I said that the people in the party were laughing at me. Well, you know, it's now on the syllabus. You know, most marketing books now will talk about, it used to be the four P's, product, place, promotion and price. There's now seven of them. 
one of which is about the physical experience. And, and there, you know, lecturers in marketing now talk about sensory branding and sensory marketing. And what's really exciting for me is to see all these young marketers coming through who are really interested in this subject. For them, it's really important to great, create great experiences, not just great promises. Thank you.